Is everybody ready? <laughs> Welcome to the third talk. Third talk of this year's IPOC Winter Seminar Series. Um, today we are lucky to have Nancy Wilson. Nancy uh, holds the SAM Chair in Marine Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Her research centers on the diversity and the conservation of life in the ocean. She is the author of Citizens of the Sea and editor in chief, editor in chief of Ocean Portal. She is senior scientist emeritus at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama and was the founding director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She serves on the national board of the Coral Reef Alliance and is a winner of the Peter Benchley Prize and the Heinz Award and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2013. So without further ado, let us welcome Nancy Holman. Can you hear me? Is it working? Excellent. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, as having uh, been the PI of an iGroup program myself at Scripps, I, uh, it's a long way to come from Washington to Seattle for one day, but I felt um, kind of clan uh, loyalty to iGroup programs around the country, and so I didn't say no to this invitation, even though my herniated disc doesn't necessarily appreciate traveling uh, across the country and coach. But anyway, for better or worse, I am. Um, and thank you for coming. Thank you also for the very nice weather that we've had today. It's been appreciated walking around and building the buildings. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the about ocean conservation and uh, in particular focus on some of the success stories. And so this is my, I actually changed this title last night in deference to your program, which is about ocean change. And so the question is, can the ocean ever change for the better? Um, this is part of what I do at the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian has a uh, sort of a, a, a mission statement which has to do with the importance of both increasing knowledge and diffusing knowledge. So I have a whole research role at the Smithsonian, which was alluded to in, in the intro, concerns using next-gen sequencing approaches to understand biodiversity in the ocean. We just published a paper in PNES last week, if you want to read about that, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, rather, I'm going to talk about more on, on the diffusion side of knowledge, and particularly what we can do to increase uptake of conservation messaging uh, for the betterment of the ocean. So um, this all begins with a personal story, uh, as actually many scientific careers, I think, do. Uh, for those of you who are students in the audience, you should always uh, take advantage of things that happen to you and relate to them in a kind of personal way and use them as inspiration for your research. Not everything is planned out from here to the age of 65, at least not in my case. Uh, so this is a picture I took as a grad student, actually, in uh, the north coast of Jamaica. So here you see all this live coral for those of you who uh, are used to, uh, have been snorkeling on reefs that they don't look like this much anymore. But back in the 70s, essentially 70% of the bottom was live coral. And um, we basically took these reefs for granted when we were studying them as graduate students or young faculty members. Uh, because although we knew these reefs weren't in perfect condition, and you can tell by what's not in this picture, what's not in this picture, even back in the uh, mid-1970s, uh, the, most of the fish have been removed from the system by subsistence fishing. Jamaica is a very poor country. It actually doesn't take that many people to take the fish out of a coral reef system. So there are a few plantivores up here in the corner. These are fish that are really on the order of five to six centimeters in length. And that was about it. And we bemoaned the state of the fish communities, but at the time, we also ignored the state of the fish communities because we were so happy. There were so many corals. Everyone was studying corals or coral-associated organisms. And uh, we, we made no intellectual connection between the fact that the, the reefs were healthy but the, the fish communities clearly were not. And that turned out to be um, a huge mistake because within 10 years of Doing my dissertation, those reefs had vanished. They went to a situation of about 70% living coral cover on the bottom to less than 10%. That was a pretty dramatic change. Uh, and it's the sort of change that many people who are roughly my age, or really anybody over the age of about 55, um, has seen these kinds of things and uh, occur over the course of their careers. And it's one of the reasons I think uh, it's really impossible not to be interested in conservation if you 
see these kinds of changes because they're they're so dramatic and they're and they're so uh, catastrophic for the ecosystems that we initially, as I said, took for granted. And of course, it's not just Jamaica and it's not just reefs. Uh, we're doing a giant experiment on planet Earth, so on the input side, you know, broad sense of pollution, we're putting <clears throat> nutrients in the water through agriculture and sewage, we're putting toxic materials through through industrial activities, sediments from poor construction practices along the coast and deforestation, uh, moving invasive species, potentially invasive species around, and of course, we're putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is warming the ocean and making it more acidic, and the outside of the side works in Big. And so if you think about what the ocean is like in the Anthropocene, it's perhaps no surprise that all these ecosystems are collapsing. And I know most of you study this in one sense or another, so I don't have to belabor it. But you basically have two kinds of things that we're doing as people to the ocean. Uh, on, the, on the global scale, where the, there's the carbon dioxide. And then on the local scale, there are all these other issues that are going loss of large organisms, higher nutrient loads, habitat loss. Species. And of course, all of these have effects on ocean life and on people, and some of these things, of course, have direct effects on people as well. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through about eight slides about the bad things about the ocean, and then we're going to change course. So I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, slide from Daniel Pauly about the state of fisheries, 1900, and this is what it looked like in 2000. So you've gone from a situation of greater than 11 uh, tons per kilometer squared along many, much of the coastline of the North Atlantic to uh, much more impoverished situation. Uh, this is a picture of an oyster reef in the turn of the century. These are peak as a person for scale. We've lost about 85% of all the oyster reefs. Uh, we've lost a lot of the tidal wetlands. This is a picture of 1939 where the light aerate is uh, terrestrial tidal wetland, wetlands. And here's the, um, the same uh, picture from 1989. And uh, as I note here on the slide, this is not just a loss of tidal wetlands, but of course, this is true for fisheries and all these other losses, uh, real loss in economic value of wealth and human welfare as a consequence as well. Uh, we have dead zones, uh, which continue to proliferate. So um, here you see a relatively recent map of greater than 400 globally, which again have serious economic consequences in terms of uh, fisheries losses and uh, tourism losses. And we have invasive species. Here you see a shot from the Mediterranean with being invaded by the seaweed, uh, Calerpicoxifolia, uh, uh, suppressing the growth of the native seagrass. And in the Caribbean, uh, the invasion of the, the very, very well documented now invasion of lionfish, which are incredibly effective predators on small fish and sort of aggravating the already existing overfishing problem. And then, of course, the climate change. Uh, Situation. This is uh, this uh, graph from the IPC, IPPC. So shows um, uh, a sort of an optimistic projection of, of two degrees centigrade and a pessimistic one of five degrees centigrade, depending on how we shape our future emissions. And there's a similar sort of graph that goes with ocean acidification. And of course, these changes in temperature have uh, and acidification have huge effects on coastal ecosystems, including coral reefs. This is a picture from Panama, 2010, showing a very severe episode of coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is the result of a breakdown between the coral animal and the dinoflagellate symbionts that uh, feed the coral through photosynthesis. It can cause massive mortality that's severe. It's been estimated in 1998 uh, during a major El Nino event, about 80% of the reefs in the Indian Ocean bleached, about 20% of them died. And the reason why it's such a concern to corals is because it occurs at a very, it occurs, uh, bleaching like this occurs, begins to occur a very small uh, temperature increase over the whole, the normal season in the maximum. So only, we only need one degree centigrade or two degrees Fahrenheit over the normal seasonal maximum before you start seeing these kinds of effects. And uh, as I'm sure you're also aware, ocean acidification has bad effects on coral reefs because it makes it much harder for corals to their skeletons, and this is an early paper showing how corals, some coral species actually lose their skeletons altogether in highly acidified water. And then this is a comparison of a, a situation in Papua New Guinea, which has carbon dioxide seep, so it shows a natural gradient in, in pH in a coral reef environment. So this is the lab, this is the field, and here you see a normal pH, and then here you see 
the pH levels that are expected by the end of the century. And so you've lost all of the three-dimensional complexity and almost all of the corals are a single uh, species of head forming coral instead of this crazy diversity, which is typical of the Indo-West Pacific. So, you know, that's good. That's it. <laughs> I just went over that really quickly, kind of a primer for those of you who aren't uh, day in, day out thinking and reading about the bad things about the ocean. But even for, um, you know, even for coral reef scientists, and much less the public, it's really easy with all this bad news, and this bad news appears in the papers all the time, it's really easy to get discouraged and bogged down in doom and gloom. And, um, and so hence this cartoon, which I love from the New Yorker, making a difference doesn't make a difference. And this is a, this is a problem uh, in, in a conservation context, because if people feel that there's no difference to be made, they're not going to try. And in fact, psychologists uh, have known for quite a long time that if you present someone with a huge problem and no answer, uh, no, no solution to that problem, it does, that's not a motivating piece of information. In fact, it tends to make, make people turn, turns people off. They go to the bar or whatever they do to sort of forget about bad things. And you wind up with nobody doing anything. And we're really, um, I think, well past the point in ocean conservation where continued stories of doom and gloom uh, are not necessarily having the desired effect. We're simply not scaring people into caring. Because you can't scare people into caring. They have to be scared, but also motivated to care. And uh, you know, even cons conservation professionals are, are pretty stuck in doom and gloom as well. And um, I, at, at the International Marine Conservation Congress in 2011, uh, we put together a wordle of all the abstracts in that, in that Congress. And this is what we wound up with. So here you see you know, a lot of the words you might expect, uh, marine, of course, fisheries, conservation, species management. But what was really striking about this wordle was that, you know, where are the positive words that you might expect? This is a marine conservation congress. So, so the bottom line about conservation is it's supposed to make things better. And yet, where are words like you know, recovery, success, and benefit, improve? They just want, there's only one positive word in this whole wordle. That's right here, so for those of you who are close enough to see it. And it's effect, the word is effective. Of course, I don't even know if it was in abstracts that said it was not effective or effective. <laughs> but I'll work on the assumption that it's, a pos it's this indication of some kind of positive thing. But that's the only positive sort of results, positive results word in the entire world from all the abstracts in 2011. And you know, even when, uh, when we as conservation professionals or scientists um, do talk about success, we often really don't do a very good job. In fact, one of the, I've been, as I'll go into in a little bit uh, later, I've been leading a series of workshops on, on uh, ocean conservation, and um, the, one of the worst ones I ever did was when I invited a panel of uh, uh, conservation professionals from NGOs to come and talk about what they were doing. They did a terrible job of talking about conservation successes, and I was really dismayed, and, um, and and what's really frustrating about the failure of people to talk about success stories in conservation is because they really have a, like every single success in conservation has a story. So, I mean, successes don't just happen all by themselves. Even, and, they, and they're stories of individuals who recognize a problem and see that they're, you know, that they, that there's a potential solution, they're motivated to do something, they often have to fight against sometimes considerable odds in order to achieve their success, and in the end, they're successful. You know, Hollywood, that's the sort of thing Hollywood uses as a, you know, that's the basic plot line of half the movies that come out of Hollywood. And of course, um, people in advertising also know very well the importance of story. So it's really a tragedy that we tend to talk like this as con conservation scientists. I'll, for a moment, let, uh, I'll pause for a moment so you can let this information sink in. And instead of telling a story, about what's happening. And I was actually really pleased to hear at lunch that a lot of the graduate students here go to a, a communication workshop where, in fact, they do emphasize storytelling. So I think things are getting better, but it's been a long time coming, and there's still plenty of people in the field that are not as good about communicating what's happening in conservation as they could be. And if you go on Amazon and, and search for storytelling, just, this is just one book, um, Lead with a Story, but it's, there are 
there are literally dozens of them. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, I really recommend reading this book and other books by Randy Olson. I don't know if you've had Randy come and talk to you. He's a, he's a former, he's a PhD scientist um, who got fed up with the academic world and went to Hollywood and got a film degree and has been working in science communication ever since. And he's written a couple of really important books about science communication, and this is one. So, um, you know, three years later, I went to the IMCC again, or actually, I didn't go, but I got the abstracts and did, we did another analysis. So here's the Wordle from uh, 2014. Um, well, there's two words, effective, and we have benefits up here, which is a new arrival in the Wordle scene. So I guess you could say that there's sort of an increase in talking about success stories, but it's still a long way from what I think it should be. And, but in 2014, we, um, we actually uh, launched something called uh, Hashtag Ocean Optimism. Uh, and that has actually started, I think, to uh, create, create a difference. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I created the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, um, we used to have a summer boot camp for, uh, because we had, like you all have, we had economists and biologists and sociologists and all these different people from different backgrounds and we wanted to get them all on the same page so we would uh, bring them together for not from nine to four for nine weeks during the summer and um, and we began this boot camp every year with talks by me and my husband Jeremy Jackson who does doing really well for those of you who haven't seen him watch his TED talk how we wreck the ocean it's a kind of classic confusion group um, and we, we would stand up there in front of all the students and talk about the state of the ocean and sort of, sort of take those eight slides that I started with and turn them into three days. And, and we watch the students, and I would watch the students, and I would sort of see them kind of sinking in their seats and, um, and really, uh, you, I can almost see them thinking, why did I choose this field? There's, you know, this is so hopeless and so awful. Uh, this is a big career mistake. And um, I don't know if they're really thinking that. Probably they weren't actually rethinking it, since no one I don't think ever dropped out. But um, but still, it was kind of, it was a really depressing way to begin uh, what should have been a kind of inspirational voyage for them. Uh, they were one year masters or five year or so PhD. And I started thinking about our program as a kind of a medical school for the ocean. And then I started thinking, well, but when you go to medical school as a prospective doctor, you're not trained to write obituaries of your patients, you really focus on, on trying to make them better, and yet what we were doing was training our students to write ever more refined obituaries of nature, and, um, or the ocean. And, and so from that came this program called Beyond the Obituaries, where, as I mentioned, I, we, I would run symposia that, uh, where I bring people to talk about success stories in ocean conservation. And, um, and I did that for a couple of years, uh, but uh, it actually takes quite a lot of time to run a symposium, and then you put all this effort into it, and then only about 150 people in the room. And so we, I joined forces with a bunch of other people, and we launched, uh, we had a workshop in the summer, and then we launched this thing called Ocean Op Hashtag Ocean Optimism. So for those of you on Twitter, what we do is, um, anytime we see or uh, <coughs> a positive story about the state of the ocean, we, um, we, we flag it with the hashtag ocean optimism. And it's actually really taken off in a surprising way. Uh, Trevor Branch has actually been a big tweeter and retweeter of ocean optimism stories, which I'm very appreciative of. And um, I think it's the beginning, it's an example of the beginning of a change in communication style, which I think is, is really um, important to have. If we're going to take conservation and make it, turn it from something that's kind of a elite uh, pastime to a, what I would call global passion. We, we need to preach to more than the choir. And to do that, I think we need to start talking about what's working. So that's that's one of the things that we've done. Um, so and here are a few examples of some of these tweets. This is just from one day. So I think every day there are probably about five to ten tweets about ocean optimism, which you can find. It's a nice way of actually searching for them. Now, of course, in some cases, it's just a picture of a sunset on the beach, you know, saying with a hashtag ocean optimism, which was exactly what we had in mind when we launched this thing. But you know, 
made this, this forever and ever chatting about you can't control hashtags, so you know we'll take whatever we can get. And, and it's actually it's been really gratifying to, to try to be part of a of an effort to change the conversation. So what I'd like to do now for the rest of the talk is um, actually just share with you some of the examples because right now what we're doing is sort of in a process of trying to collect examples of success stories in ocean conservation. And it turns out that there are a lot more of them than most people realize. In fact, early on when I was running these symposia on, on the Beyond the Obituary Symposia, the first one, I, big one I ever did was actually associated with a meeting on conservation. And, and we had a whole meeting ahead of the meeting for a day at the Smithsonian. And I remember um, one of my colleagues coming up to me and saying, you can't have a whole day on ocean success stories and not that many success stories out there. And in the end, there were some, there were so many success stories that we had, you know, nobody could speak for more than about five minutes. It was like speed dating for ocean success stories. And so I came to realize that there, there were all these successes out there and no one, no single person knew uh, about even a tiny fraction of them. And that's because there's no place where you can find them readily. They're buried in great literature or, or promotional materials for individual NGOs or you run across them. And every time I go to, a, to, to give a talk, somebody comes up to me and says, oh, did you know about such and such? And 99% of the time, I didn't know about such and such. And so there's this huge need to talk about these successes. And what I'm actually really working on now is trying to create within this website that I run, the Ocean Portal, a space where people can post blogs and images and videos about ocean success stories. And so it's a kind of a destination where they can be found. So I don't have that enough time to even begin to do justice to all the success stories. So I'm just going to uh, talk about um, 10 of them in the context of these categories. So there are various ways you can think about successes, but I think this works pretty well. Saving species, protecting spaces, harvesting wisely, reducing pollution, restoring habitat. So I'm going to tell you 10 quick stories. So first one, saving species. Saving species is actually probably some of the, one of the things we've done the best job of uh, in terms of ocean conservation. And in fact, uh, Trevor reminded me of another success story. We don't quite telling Trevor's stories here because you've all heard Trevor's stories, I'm assuming. But he's involved in a really nice story about successes in the recovery of uh, the whales. And in fact, whales in general are, are a, a really interesting example of, of where making a difference uh, in, where making a difference has occurred. And, uh, and so these are not that story, but other stories. So here's the story about puffins. Now, in, you know, in 1901, there was just one pair of puffins that were nesting in the United States. So that's a pretty small number. And now there are hundreds. And you know, why are there hundreds? There are hundreds for two reasons. One, because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, uh, which uh, prevented hunting on puffins and puffin eggs. But there also are more because of the science and determination of a, of a ornithologist named uh, Stephen Kress. And what Stephen Kress, he, so he was trying to get puffins to come back to the coast of Maine. And he was having a lot of difficulty. And then he started thinking about, you know, what does a puffin, when a puffin looks at a rock as a possible nesting area, what does that puffin care about? And then he sort of dawned on him. I've actually never interviewed him. I just went on my to-do list of things to do that I really need to do. But it dawned on him that what they were looking at is not so much the rock, but whether there are other puffins on the rock. And in that sense, puffins are rather like people. Um, people like you know other people around them. It makes them feel comfortable. The same goes for puffins. And so he started putting stuffed puffins on the rocks. And lo and behold, a lot of unstuffed puffins started arriving to nest there as well. And so as a consequence of the protection you know, on a top-down basis, and this kind of scientific insight on a bottom-up basis, the numbers of puffins are now in the hundreds of breeding pairs rather than uh, just one. So that's a really, it's a small story, but it's a really nice story of how science and individual determination and creativity can make a difference. Here's another um, story, which actually I learned during one of these, um, these six, these, uh, the Amiobitri symposiums. Um, it told me, um, the person who gave us, who gave a presentation told the story of this woman named Claudia Lee. Now, Claudia Lee was a business student at Simon Fraser University, so she wasn't, she wasn't even a biologist. And in fact, initially, she was rather skeptical of the 
fact that Chinese cultural traditions were larger or a major force in the decimation of shark populations around the world. Um, and, and she felt it was an attack on Chinese culture. But for one reason or another, she saw the light. I believe she saw a film, in fact, and real, woke up in the morning. Actually, couldn't sleep all night. Woke up in the morning and said, I can't, I'm, I'm not comfortable with being a member of the Chinese Canadian community and, and not doing something to change the way the Chinese relate to sharks because it's, it's, the sharks are in terrible shape and our cultural traditions are a big contributor to her. So she started this NGO called Shark Truth. Um, and the idea, she being a business student, I thought this was really clever. She, she, uh, she thought about, you know, what is the, where is it, what's the pressure point? Where can, where can I make the biggest difference? Because sometimes, as biologists, we just kind of uh, think about, oh, you know, all sorts of different things. But she said, you know, she has sort of a bottom line attitude about this that comes from being a business student. And she realized that a big chunk of the shark fins that were being served uh, in a Chinese cultural context were being served at weddings. Uh, and so she started a contest for wedding uh, for engaged couples in uh, Vancouver, and she used her uncle's frequent flyer miles to pay for the honeymoon trip of the winning couple who had the most creative non-shark fin wedding. Um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, so these are some of the, some of the images from her, uh, her website, she estimates that she saved about um, eight, 1,800 sharks, which represent about 18,000 bowls of shark fins. So it turns out that essentially one wedding table is a, a one shark uh, in terms of the, the decimation of the cost. And what's, it, what's interesting about this example is not just the example, but the fact that it is an example of so many other efforts around the world. Because sharks are, they're hardly in great shape yet, but, they're, but, but the momentum in shark conservation has really shifted in the last five years. And part of it's sort of a moral, emotional response like Claudia Lee had, but some of it is very simple dollars and cents. In fact, uh, an analysis done uh, in Palau suggested that dead sharks were worth, um, to the Palau economy, about $108, whereas live sharks over the course of their lifetime were worth about $1.9 million. So you don't have to have a PhD in economics to know that there's a big difference between $108 and $1.9 million. And as a consequence, Palau has banned shark fishing from their waters because it just makes good dollars and cents. And this kind of combination of appealing to various you know, pressure points, if you will, um, has really spread. So now, this is a, this was, I made this slide actually a while ago, but there are shark finning and shark fin, uh, shark fin sale bans being established or already established in Central America, Europe, Palau, a uh, number of states in, in uh, the United States, I think uh, Massachusetts is, and other states are now added. But really importantly, as this last line, a lot of hotels no longer should serve shark fin soup, and the Chinese government no longer, or will no longer serve shark fin soup at its official banquets. And in fact, a number of airplane companies have now banned the transport of shark fins in their in airplane holes. So this is, the, I think this is very similar this trajectory of what's happening to shark fins and, and shark protection is very similar to what's happened with um, gay marriage in the United States, where um, you know, 10 years ago, who would have thought we'd be where we are uh, today in terms of uh, gay marriage rights? And it's totally, the, the landscape has changed entirely. There's an article just today about how the Supreme Court is likely to make a decisive decision this summer that will make gay marriage universal across the United States. And you know whatever you may think about that, and I don't presume to you know, project my values on you. What is true is there's been a very nonlinear, very rapid social transformation on what's considered uh, appropriate and not appropriate. And the same thing is happening with sharks. And I think it's really important to remember that when humans, as a society, decide to do something, it often the decision process and the change process actually can be very quick. And it, and, and I think that's essential to remember when. Uh, when you get discouraged about things going too slowly, because things don't necessarily go so slowly. Okay, so protecting spaces. This is a story, some of you may have read this story from Kamapomo. It's in the tip of Baja California. And it's a story of a small village, a uh, fishing village, almost essentially an extended family. And uh, the Pater Familias, uh, after you know, 
and watching the cash per unit effort decline over the course of years, having tourism decline because there was nothing to look at underwater, and having scientists come and say that their fisheries were hardly overexploited, got the community together and convinced them to set up a marine protected area in Kabul. And so that's what they did. And here you see the results. Um, this is so this is a comparison of 1999 to 2009 for places with no regulation. So these are the this is the mean biomass of fish here. So no change in places with open access. Also no change in government run marine protected areas where there was no no essentially no enforcement. But here you see the change in Cabo Pomo National Park, 1999, 2009, more than four tons of biomass, uh, fish biomass per hectare. And it's been argued that this might be the most successful marine protected area on the planet. And of course, it's not just the fish that are benefiting. It's been estimated that the average income increase for people associated with tourism in the region has increased by about $18,000 a year, which is a huge increase in income as a consequence of, of for, you know, small fishing village kind of economy in Mexico. Okay, what about protecting spaces? Um, in this, in a bigger sense, so that was a really, that's a really tiny green protected area. Here are some maps, uh, and again, this slide I should update it with lots more of them, but here you see the Northwest Hawaiian Island uh, uh, National Marine Monument, and here you see the Great Barrier Reef, where about one third of the Great Barrier Reef is prevented, is off limits for fishing. You know, in the, this is an example of sort of low-hanging fruit. Uh, there are only six fishing boats in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, so it was an enormous political challenge. I mean, it's such low-hanging fruit, you could almost say it was on the ground already. Uh, and there have been a lot of new marine protected areas being are being put into place in these, in these places that are so remote that the costs are relatively small politically. And that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not, part, um, I'm not saying that that's not important, but this is actually a more impressive achievement uh, because there are lots of people on the coast of Australia, uh, and it required an enormous political effort. And it's not perfect, and there are, you know, there are signs that poor management of uh, watersheds are actually undermining the fishing bans. But it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. Okay, what about harvesting? Why is it? Because not all of protection is about about just delimiting spaces that you can't fish in at all. And people need to eat fish in order to survive in many parts of the World. So this is an example, actually, from a place where you wouldn't normally think of as the epicenter of, of protection. This is Southern California. Uh, and what's really interesting is that there's been the documented return of apex predators to the Southern California coastline. Now, why did this occur? It occurred because they, uh, in 1994, they, I mean, there are probably a couple of reasons, but a major reason is in 1994 they banned uh, gill nets near shore. And that's resulted in all sorts of return of these large of organisms get to large size that need to get near shore in order to uh, breed. So here you see the California commercial catch uh, line for here. And then this is a this is the kind of picture that you normally see, it's usually a guy, I have to say, holding this fish. Usually the guy has you know handlebar mustaches and it's clearly a 150-year-old picture. This is clearly, this is a cool sort of recent dude and, uh, and it's a kind of symbol of, of what's happened in Southern California as a consequence. Okay, here's another graph, um, and this is uh, something also that I know Tim Essington has written about uh, on individual uh, transportal quotas. And this particular paper, Costello and Science, this is a map of where the, the ICQs are, uh, documented that uh, these tend to reduce collapsed probability of fisheries by about a half. And, and actually, uh, Tim's paper also documents the reduced variability associated with ICQs. So, Here's another example where, um, where managing fisheries wisely has, the, has potential benefits. And the example that I think is really nice is the one along the uh, Chilean coast here, which is a management of a small uh, shellfish called Chilean abalones uh, locos, where the fishery has been transformed by small-scale collaborative community efforts to manage the fisheries wisely. Okay, what about reducing pollution? This is one of my favorite examples because I think it is a story that we've completely forgotten. Uh, Daniel Pauly um, talked about shifting baselines, and usually what he means is the fact that every generation uh, we forget how wonderful things were and we accept these crappy environments as normal because that's the way they were when we were kids. But we also have kind of a backward shifting baseline. We forget 
about the real improvements in the environment that we've achieved thanks to our efforts. And a classic example, of course, is the banning of DDT, thanks to the publication by Rachel Carson in 1962, in a really revolutionary event in terms of the uh, US environmental history. And here you see the recovery of ospreys in just one particular catchment area from 1975, a couple years after the DDT was banned, uh, until you know, 2008 or so. And where uh, I spend a lot of time on the coast of Maine, their ospreys are everywhere. I mean, they're like, you know, not quite trash birds, but they're just, they're, you don't worry about ospreys. And yet, I, I suspect if you ask most people why there are so many ospreys, they wouldn't be able to tell you, it's because it's something we did. We passed a law getting rid of DDT. Tea. And now we have ospreys on the coast. And in fact, I was talking to somebody in Florida the other day who said that brown pelicans were even a more striking marine case. And it was only because they were really long-lived that they actually survived, because they were really on the precipice. And a few ones were long enough lived to sort of survive the DDT epidemic and make it through and recover. So we have these species on our shorelines, you know, thanks to something we did. And yet we tend to forget about these things. And I think that forgetting process makes us very powerless. You know, there are lots of other examples of reducing pollution, and one of the ones I particularly like is um, the use of pollution to turn a profit. This is one example of U.S. entrepreneurs who went to Chile and turned fishnet trash into skateboards, and in the Philippines, a similar effort is using fishnets um, to turn it into high-quality rugs. And the, the reason this is good is, first of all, it gets rid of fishnets, pollution on the beach and ghost fishing underwater, but it also provides income to people that otherwise might not have energy. And then finally, restoring habitats. So this is a story about Maine and the return of alewives, which uh, alewife populations were really compromised by the presence of dams and freshwater rivers, because these species go between saltwater and freshwater. And thanks to a collaborative effort, which involved um, you know, indigenous peoples, NGOs, electric companies, and various state and federal agencies, and the removal of these dams, these fish are coming back to Maine. And that's a real success story, and it's not a, just a success story for the fish, because this is food for striped bats, tuna, bald eagles, and they support a lot of tourists. All those things support a lot of people as well. And then finally, a story about uh, restoring uh, shellfish communities. This is work done by uh, Ron Lipsis at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, who's published in Science years ago now. And this is sort of a, a Steve Kress-like story where, where a lot of money had been thrown into trying to restore oysters in Chesapeake Bay um, without much, I mean millions of dollars have been thrown into the effort to try to restore uh, oysters in Chesapeake Bay to little effect. And what he had the insight, uh, what he did was have the insight that <coughs> scattering in a small scale well like oysters in the bottom was a futile exercise because the mud on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay, having destroyed all the, Ches the oysters that were there before, essentially smothered everything, and so none of them would survive. But if you make big piles of oysters, the ones on the top are raised up above the surface of the mud, and they do pretty well. So here you see um, uh, the, the, the growth rate of these oyster reefs in, in places with low relief oyster reefs, and then up here, it's a, the oyster reefs that are you know, big piles of oysters, that are, which you can see here. And, uh, and so this is a, another nice example of a combination of, of insight, and determination, and science uh, to make a difference in terms of restoration. And now there are all sorts of stories um, about the success of oyster restoration in the Chesapeake and elsewhere. And um, I, I love this. This is a kind of an aside on the important images. This was a tweet that came out um, last uh, in October, I guess. Um, and so that if, for those of you who can't read in the back, it says, Want to know what oysters do for the environment? The water in both tanks is the same. The one on the right has oysters. It's, it's brilliant. I've got 6,000 retweets. I mean, this is a really successful um, uh, use of an image of muddy water and oysters <coughs> to convey the importance of oyster restoration. So I want to uh, close up now with a few sort of general comments. So the first is I don't want you to think that I think that these examples and the hundreds that I'm not telling you are you know, all we need to do for ocean conservation. It's, you know, the ocean is still going downhill. So I, it's not that I you know, have on these rosy glasses, tinty glasses, and I think everything is wonderful. I'm more than aware uh, of how desperate the situation is in many places around the world. It's just that I think if we only talk about that, um, there's, we, we're not doing conservation any favor. 
So this is, in fact, an example of where this really was brought home to me. I was asked by the State Department to go to the Philippines. The U.S. managed to ground a, a ship on one of the most protected reefs of the Philippines. And so um, they asked me to come and talk to various colleges and high schools around the Philippines about coral reefs to show that even though we weren't going to formally say, you know, necessarily, I'm sorry, you know, we did actually feel really badly about it. So I went to the Philippines and gave these talks. But they, in the course of this trip, um, they um, took me on a dot, and this is where they took me. And uh, I had to say, this is the only place I've ever been diving where I can swear I swam for 40 minutes and didn't see a single live fish. It was more depressing than the north coast of Jamaica by a lot. And so here you see the reef. Uh, this is mostly seaweed, and these white spots are all corals that are bleaching from unusually warm temperatures. And this is this kind of thing is not uncommon in the Philippines. I mean, they reminded me that when I showed them these pictures, some of you know, people were horrified. Why did they hate you there? But it was. But I told them, I said, you know, it's really important for me to see these places. Um, you know, I can go to a fancy, nice place anytime. So to actually dive in a place like this is a important and vivid reminder of the scale of the problem that we face. And this is bad, of course, not just for corals, this is really bad for people. Because after this dive was over, um, we were sitting on the beach, we're all drinking because it was so depressing, and um, this fisherman walked onto the beach and started throwing his net into the water. And I turned to my host and I said, what could that person be catching? And, um, and he said, well, you know, economists have come here and they've uh, estimated that the caloric value from throwing a net into the water here for an hour is it comparable to a can of Coca-Cola? So that this is this is not this is this is a food security issue, not only for this particular village, but for many many places around the world, and it's one that has to be solved. But then on the other hand, there are, the, the other thing I did in 2013 was go to the Southern Line Islands. The Southern Line Islands are sort of between they're between Hawaii and Tahiti. Uh, they're, they take it takes a long time to get there. They're so far they're so far away that it's just not economical to ruin them. So they haven't been fished, um, and this is what this is what these reefs look like. So cover, look, living coral cover on the bottom, approaching 100 percent. In the water, are just so many sharks and, and snappers and manta rays and turtles. Um, it's just an, an amazing place, and this is an image of what coral reefs used to look like around the world before we basically wrecked them, and. Um, why this is important not only for two reasons. One is it's just nice to know that there are still places on the planet that look like this. But the much more important reason from a conservation perspective is that this tells you that as bad as climate change and ocean acidification are, they are not what has caused most of the mortality from coral reefs today. But these reefs look beautiful. They're protected from overfishing and they're protected. They've got the same amount of uh, pH, and they've got the same problem with global warming as any other place, any other reef place on the planet. But they still look gorgeous. They look gorgeous because they've been protected from global threats. And so this is a really hopeful message because it tells us that if we do something about local threats, which is something we actually can do right now, we have the potential for making a real difference uh, while we figure out the much bigger problem. And this, is, this has been this, this conclusion of the overwhelming importance today of local impacts uh, has been sustained for a number of different studies. Uh, in fact, um, my husband has just finished an analysis of the Caribbean, which was published in a big report by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which showed that very clearly for Caribbean reefs, the, the overwhelming amount of the overwhelming proportion of the damage done to Caribbean coral reefs, which has been enormous. Um, has been done by overfishing and uh, pollution. That's not to say that climate change and ocean acidification are unimportant. They're, they're important and they're increasingly important. But to date, most of how we direct the ocean has been through local activities, not climate change and ocean acidification. And, and this is not only true for coral reefs. This is an analysis that was published by uh, a, colleague, a colleague of mine at CERC, uh, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Nature in 2013, on wetland loss. And I showed you that picture earlier of wetland loss, and it looks like it's all sea level rise. But what they argue is that um, most wetland loss today is not due to sea level rise. It's, and even in the future, this is a really important part, wetland management strategies are more important than sea rise itself. And that's because 
the way we've wrecked wetlands is either due to conversion for agriculture or aquaculture, 25 to 50 percent of the wetlands, or coastal squeeze, pollution, dams, and groundwater extractions, which keep wetlands from being able to keep up with sea level rise. So this is another example of an, an, a completely independent, very important coastal ecosystem, which could really benefit from local attention now. So if you think about you know, what we need to do in terms of ocean conservation, there are obviously two things. And what I, what, I, what I feel is important to emphasize is that, yes, we're worried incredibly about the longer term and global scale, and, um, and we don't really know how to fix the carbon dioxide problem. This is really, really is rocket science. So we have to figure out how to reduce CO2 emissions and also how to prevent extinctions as things continue to get globally worse before they very, very slowly turn around. But on the short term and the local scale, we can control fishing, we can improve water quality, we can limit how that operation. This is not rocket science. This we know how to do now. And to focus entirely on this is so counterproductive, not only in terms of motivating people to make a difference, because most people feel they can't do anything like this, but they can be convinced that they can do something like this. But it, this buys incredibly valuable time. So we protect our coastal ecosystems um, by acting on a short term and a local scale while we figure out this, this bigger problem. OK, so now action, the two, two last slides. Action requires inspiration. I sort of was alluded to this earlier about the importance of not going totally doom and gloom. So this is, a, this is an article that was published you know, in, the, in the New York Times by this incredible guy, uh, Rear Admiral Timothy Seymour, who's made a lifelong career fighting malaria. And the, and the title of the article is called The Malaria Fighter. And it was this wonderful multi-page article about his story and what he's doing. We do a really good job of celebrating our ocean heroes. We don't do nearly as good a job as celebrating our conservation heroes. So why don't we have an article in the New York Times, you know, the Puffin Whisperer or whatever else you want to call it. It's, it's important that people see these exemplars of people making a difference because it inspires them to make and then finally, this is the last slide. So I was asked um, to go to the Vatican to talk about the ocean, which was pretty intimidating. And um, so here's a picture of the after the meeting. And you know, who would have thought that we'd have a pope that would be the head of a church that invited not only me, but also Naomi Oreskes, the author of Merchants of Doubt, and also uh, the editor, now editor of um, Science, and a bunch of other environmental thinkers to talk about sustainability. Things have changed really quickly. And so after this meeting, um, uh, the, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis said, safeguard creation, because if we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. And he's on the verge of uh, releasing an encyclopedic uh, pontifical discourse on climate change. Now, why does he care about climate change? He cares about climate change because the people on the front line of all environmental degradation, climate change included, and that's what he cares about. But nevertheless, it means we have a very powerful force working in alliance with environmental um, uh, people with environmental concerns uh, to actually make a difference. So you know, if you ask me, you know, am I pessimistic about the state of the ocean, am I optimistic about the state of the ocean? You know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not wildly, you know, delusionally optimistic, but but I remain, as I we coined that phrase, an ocean optimist, because I see there's so much potential change. There's so much we can do. It's just really a question of motivating and capturing the energy to do good and, and applying it to these problems. So I'll take any questions. Okay, the question was, how long would it take coral reefs to bounce back if we got rid of all the local stressors? Uh, well, the, it sort of depends on what part of I mean, fish bounce back actually remarkably quickly. When you stop eating fish, by and large, they become more and more numerous. There are some notable exceptions of, place, of situations where um, we've tried to control fishing and the response really hasn't occurred in cod being, I think, perhaps the most striking example, really, an area where we've actually tried. And, there's still aren't many cod, and now, of course, it's getting aggravated by, by climate change as well. But fish tend to bounce back within the course of, say, 10 to 20 years. Corals are a little bit more slow growing, but some are out. 
typically growing corals actually do grow back within about 10, 20, certainly a couple of, you know, on the order of, say, two to three decades, you can get really marvelous recovery of corals as, uh, as well. So, you know, if we were to really eliminate local stressors, I think you're talking about decades. You're not talking about centuries. You're talking about something measurable. for such a wise talk first. And then this is, I don't know, this is a really um, clear question to ask of you, but I was struck um, by the sense that a lot of what needs to be done is not rocket science. And that um, leads me to the question of how much effort we should put into science just to, versus um, using what we already know, like the things that you listed on that section. And maybe you could just reflect on that a little bit in terms of how you've managed to balance your time well, I do think you need both, and because I think we do need a lot of it. The science for climate and ocean acidification is far from settled, and um, and understanding how these changes are likely to play out in the over the course of a number of decades in the future is really an important thing to do. But I think you also have to um, work on the short term and local scale as well in the meantime. That's not me. I don't mean that by you in a, as an individual, but the scientific slash conservation community doesn't make any sense to do only one or do only the other. I think it's important to do to do both. And you know, fortunately, the human beings are a very diverse lot. Some people like a lot being you know in a laboratory till two in the morning doing fancy experiments with um, all sorts of uh, manipulations of carbon dioxide, uh, and other people like boots on the ground working with fishermen trying to help them have a better life. And uh, and it's good that we have both kinds and everybody sort of in between that spectrum uh, of people working on the ocean because we actually need it. In terms of my personal, I mean, what I, I tend, I don't actually do boots on the ground, but I do a lot of, um, I, I do a lot of basic science trying to understand biodiversity. And then I, I probably spend about 50% of my time doing that and about 50% of my time uh, talking about ocean conservation, success stories in ocean conservation, and working on this project to make those success stories more visible to the public. But it's but there's not a right answer. It's a it's an answer. Um, I'm very skeptical of some kind of analysis that said would say that we should spend 37% of our time doing this and the remaining percent of the time doing that. I, I don't think we understand what we should do well enough to you know to be, be that precise and I, I think Passion and energy and commitment are probably more important than a top-down analysis of the optimization of, of effort. Uh, so I, I think we should do both. And it, um, I wouldn't be in a position to say you know we should change it in one way or another. I think I think the main thing we need to do is do what we do better uh, and more energetically. But I'm not so worried about the balance between um, short-term and long-term non-rocket science. And I think, you know, I think you could, you know, you don't have to look that hard for real success stories, even bigger than the ones you pointed out, like the fur seal tree, uh, you know, the sea otters, the fur seals, Absolutely. the halibut commission, you know, early 1900s, I, this and, is and, a, the, and, the, and the Alaska fisheries, I think, is another much bigger story than, than some of these, but I don't, I think the pessimism is, really is well, you may not think the pessimism isn't justified. I don't think the pessimism isn't justified. But if you go on the street and ask somebody about what the state of the ocean is and whether there's anything to do that we can do to, to help things, you, the response you'll get is it's hopeless. The ocean is too big and too far gone to save. And um, these are just, I mean, I use these examples because they represent a combination of, you know, of history and present day between small scale and large scale, um, and they're just examples. I, you know, Alaska. I could use the Alaskan fisheries. I could, for sure, the sea otters. I mean, all those things. But I could, and I could use other smaller scale examples, which I haven't. I think, you know, in developing country contexts where you've got the lack of um, powerful central enforcement, Cabo Pomo being an excellent that graph from the Cabo Pomo slide being an excellent example. A lot of the effort is going to have to be local, and you have to get local buy-in by local, you know, communities 
on, on the ground in front of the, literally in front of those resources. In a country like the United States or Australia or the EU, you can have, you know, you have the potential for operating at a higher sort of legal level because enforcement is less of an issue. But even in the United States, I would argue, if you don't have local buy-in and you don't have people, you know, on the, on the, you know, who are being impacted by regulations, enthusiastic about those regulations, you're sort of running a, a losing battle. So, yes, you can change all these examples, but, you know, as I say, a lot more, and that's one of the goals of trying to put together this website so people can find the examples that resonate with them. I, uh, my, my goal is well, at least well, as, How about right in California? I mean, you don't yep. have to go down to Baja, California. I mean, you look at the marine protections. Well, that's why, I, that's why I gave the example of the return of apex predators to Southern California. And, yeah. and then there are all the marine protect. I mean, there's so many of them. That's the point. You know, you're making my point in a way. There's so many of these successes. And, but most people are completely oblivious. They have no idea that these successes are all around us. Right. And, and that's really what I want to change. Yes? Do you have any thoughts about how to change the uh, psychology of the media? I mean, I think the reality is that bad news sells a lot better than good news. So how do you, how do you well, yeah, the, the whole question of is it bleeds, it leads uh, sort of an inevitable part of the media world. And there is a certain uh, element of that, in fact, Trevor was saying how when you tweet something negative, it gets lots more retweets and we tweet something positive, we tweet something positive. But I think that's changing. Um, and I'm not saying it will disappear, that tendency to focus on the negative. I mean, we are kind of a species that loves catastrophe, seeing not our own kinds of catastrophes, but seeing somebody else's catastrophes when we gravitate to train wrecks and train crashes and things like that. But, um, and certainly the Earth is kind of like this giant planetary plane crash. But, um, but for example, in the shark story that I that mentioned about a tipping point, this summer, there was a really interesting article in the New York Times. So instead of an article about you know, the demise of shark fins and everything, there was an article, I don't know how many of you saw, how many of you have seen Jaws, by the way, because if you haven't seen Jaws, this will make sense. <laughs> so you know, there's an article in the New York Times about how uh, tourism is driving protection of sharks in Cape Cod. And the title, the headline of the the, media, the story was, we're going to need a bigger gift shop. For those of you who have seen us, <laughs> I can't explain it to you shortly, quickly, if you haven't, but ask your friend um, or watch the movie. It's actually kind of an interesting movie. But um, so that's another example. Just, last, just the other day, uh, there was a piece in Huffington Post about this. It says it's, it's, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, something like, uh, at least not all environmental stories are bad news. And it was about this new um, uh, movie being made by McGillivray, the Freeman Company, about the recovery of humpback whales. So I, I actually think even the newspaper sort of police blogger mentality for the environment is starting to shift as, as, as and it's not because they think it's, you know, they don't care what I think about the importance of motivating the public, but they do care about whether the public is going to read the article. And I think, essentially, what's happened is that the doom and gloom news has been so unrelenting that people now glaze over. And, and there's still, it's still a problem. For example, just two weeks ago, there was a paper, there were, there were and I didn't put this in my presentation for reasons of time, but there was, um, you know, there was a paper that was published in Science saying that we are on, that because of our industrialization of the ocean, we are on the road to having as many ocean extinctions as we are extinctions on land. But the paper itself was rather, in some ways, upbeat, because it said, we're not there yet. And you know, if we take steps, we can make a difference. Nevertheless, the New York Times uh, headline was, Ocean Faces Mass Extinction. And similarly, there was a, a, a piece, uh, an article in Science Room, I can't remember where, on how we're um, you know, tipping date called Managing the Global sea Ecosystem in a Rapidly Changing World. But the headline in the Washington Post was, Earth Surpasses Four or Eight Tipping Points, or something like that. So there's still, I'm not saying that there's, you know, this is not still part of the media world. But there's also increasingly stories about good news, because I think they're starting to realize that some readers actually do like to hear about good news in the environment, just the way they like to hear that there's been a cure for malaria, or you know, some solution for diabetes. I mean, the, the medical 
I've actually always wanted to do this, and med but, it, but sort of intuitively, it seems to me that the media coverage of medicine is much more balanced between threats and solutions than it is for the environment. So I don't see any reason why the environment can't move to a medical model. Yeah? Do you get blowback from some conservationists who think that a positive medicine Sometimes people say you can't say anything po positive about the environment because then people will stop uh, caring about the environment. Uh, but I think there is an increasingly widespread, re widespread recognition that doom and gloom is no longer, it, that, that doom and gloom just doesn't work anymore. So if that doesn't work, we've got to do something else. What scientists aren't going to be happy about, and I'm completely in agreement with this, is that it's really important to tell the story in a way that's accurate. So it's not like you want to talk about something in a way that's misleading. But as long as you are not misleading, I think most people, and there was actually a very interesting article that was published in Bioscience in December about how science, there's a tendency among scientists to chase the, the if it leads, it leads headlines and overestimate the, the nature of the environmental but I think as long as you uh, as long as you present it fairly, then I don't think the pushback will be too extreme. There's there's some debate. I mean, but I'm not. It doesn't. It's a, to me, it's much more important to figure out how to get these stories out than it is to worry about the pushback from a small number of uh, environmental scientists who think we're giving safe haven to evil actors. Yes. You mentioned dams, a great talk about You mentioned dams, and I hear we had talking to all our dams, and of course the salmon are back up there really fast. And you mentioned that in Maine, and there, are there other places where people are thinking about dams? Yeah, actually making a concert. I think there are certainly there are places besides Maine. I think there's been a big effort in Connecticut, for example. I don't have uh, up to date. See, I'm a perfect example of not knowing that all the success stories. That are you know I collect them, but I don't have comprehensive knowledge, and I don't know about say the West Coast, uh, what the exact state of dam removal is. Um, but certainly on the East Coast, it's not limited to Maine. And everyone, we're out of time for questions. But I urge you to join us in the lobby for a reception and to come back every Tuesday, same time for the other talks in the seminar series. <laughs>